The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everybody, to today's Prospero session. My name's Derek Krebs. I'll be your host today, providing you some nice little tips and tricks of the application. So welcome, one and all. A few little house cleaning notes. I'll introduce myself further, and we'll spend a couple minutes in PowerPoint introducing today's topic. Otherwise, the bulk of the session, we're going to look at some nice little product functionalities and features. For this go-to webinar session, everybody is in listen-only mode, so you're muted. If you have any questions, please take advantage of the question queue there to your right in what's called the go-to meeting control panel. And if that window is ever blocking your view to the right, you have an orange arrow you can click that's pointing to the left or right to minimize or maximize that window. For the first couple of moments in PowerPoint, let me introduce myself further in today's topic. My name is Derek Krebs. I'm a senior consultant with the MSX Group, and I've been doing this for a very, very long time, <laughs> going on about 25 years. And the first 15 of those years, I and the rest of our staff at MSX Group, we worked at FRX Software and Microsoft. <clears throat> and then we helped develop, deploy, consult, and even support today, people on those flagship Microsoft products. And 10 years ago is when we released to the market the Prospero application. So I see most of our attendees are existing Prospero customers, but there's a handful who are prospective ones. So thank you all for attending today. These sessions will be recorded and a few days after the live presentation, we'll send a little email thank you along with a link to those recordings you maybe later view or share with your coworkers. And for those that are new to Prospero, just a couple little high level remarks is yes, it does both the reporting and budgeting of both general ledger data, which will be our primary focus, but even non-general ledger data. A few examples I'll show you today of non-GL data would be taking actuals and or budgets down to head count, number of units sold, maybe some margins or other KP performance indicators. Or a second example <clears throat> might be on the budgeting side. Perhaps I want to take my budget down to the employee or position, which might not be a segment or dimension in my general ledger. Or another would be maybe our sales and cost of goods sold, perhaps down to the product or customer. Again, maybe not in our general ledger, but possibilities are endless of what you can include inside Prospero. It has all the other bells and whistles regarding charting and graphing, drill down to the account and transaction detail, the migration available from the flagship Microsoft products to hit the ground running to bring on your existing reports and budgets into Prospero seamlessly. So there's a few high level remarks. And how about for today's session, devoted to budgeting crash course and tips and tricks. Let me just outline about 10 sort of bullet points here. And some are a little bit more generically named and I guess the theme would be also, let's get off of Excel. <laughs> that is the painful old school way of doing things. So the first bullet point, <clears throat> when I take you to the budget input screen, some keywords will be interacting with our budget, nice little information sharing, one version of the truth. We have reasonable templates like our rows, columns, and trees. Oh my, how sweet they are. Additionally, related to lines, I'll toggle between a few different departments and we have what are called overrides. That way you might have 100 departments that you lay out the table, but you might have three or four different templates or line sets that have little unique little budget looks and feels based on maybe a pure expense only de department, or maybe one that has revenue and cost of goods sold, et cetera, and some statistics that you might wanna account for. There's some nice supporting detail behind our budgets. We'll focus on HR and capital. I referenced revenue earlier that I'll definitely show you an example for. And additionally, there's nice audit trail history. You can see who made changes to what accounts and when. Line item details where you might take certain expense accounts, let's call it travel, break it down to trip one, two, or three, and even add some nice little annotations for that nice little information sharing, transparency, interaction theme. These are all real-time inputs into the system. So especially as I'm thinking about the old Microsoft forecaster way, we always had to manually bring in general ledger segments like accounts and departments. 
We had to manual the old way, bring in actuals and budgets to and from our budgeting and reporting system. All of those manual ways are done and automated within Prospero. I'll obviously shed more light on that as well. And within the column, we're going to look at a few different column techniques of some rolling forecasts, some little time periods and budget versions that we can input. And we call those book codes like budget version one or book code one or budget version two, what we call book code number two. And then also definitely key element would be security of who has access to what given location apartments. We call those assignments or additionally visibility. Like maybe I'm working on two different budgets, a best case and a worst case. Maybe they have only visibility and access to one certain budget version or as many as you wish. All right, and then also time permitting, I'll show you some various examples that you might be just the tip of the iceberg on your initial deployment or budget use, but now that you have this fancy, nice tool here. We can now uh, centralize what you might be doing offline and maybe get more users involved in the process instead of centrally force feeding it down to them. So there's my initial thoughts and reflections of working with all these customers over the years. All right, that's about it in the intro. So we're now going to spend the rest of the time inside the application. When I do show you the application, I'll usually show you maybe two or three perspectives. One is an end user perspective, which I'm currently broadcasting. And the second primary one is perhaps of a power user, like most of you in the finance and accounting area attending today of some setup and maintenance behind the scenes that you'll have. But Thankfully, it's so easy and intuitive. We always be transparent just to show you what's involved behind it, especially those prospective customers looking at a nice little budgeting tool. Now, for the end user perspective, whenever I launch Prospero, either it be a client or a web interface, we can easily deploy it in a couple different ways. We're either on your servers, a third-party servers, or maybe MSX Group hosts it, which I'll show is nice that you have options of your deployment method. Regardless, whenever I launch Prospero, I have a nice little quick launch window we're currently seeing of just favorites. Like how about here, this column called reports and charts. How about every single month, I view two financial reports, the top one, actual versus budget, or the bottom one being a rolling 12 month, nice little trend I like to see. Or secondly, I might have a shortcut favorite to my budget input screen. And even though you might have more than one budget version you're working on at this point in time, this user only has access to what I'll call the base case budget. And let me even start by opening up this report. <clears throat> now let me acquaint you with our sample company's structure. We actually have multiple company, including locations and departments within our general ledger that might mimic your chart of account setup. Now, this user, for what we call their user security assignments, is limited on what they see. So, for an example, I'm now showing you the company pick list. They have access just to company one. Or, additionally, locations, we have numerous, and they only have access to the Denver location. But how about third and finally, I'm viewing a report that I'll start with, but then I'll segue to the budget input screen. Now, for the report is where I can see summary consolidated items. In this case, in the department, we're looking at this item called all, which is a summary level. This is a list of our departments, but many times I like to see a graphical tree and we can have various trees that you maybe group and slice and dice, let's say the departments in any way you wish, but this all tree automatically gets created and maintained, huge win. Now I'm going to analyze looking at all of my departments. Now this is real time because maybe I spent the last couple of days inputting my budget and now real time I don't have to manually consolidate that as an end user or especially you the power user. Here's my budget data all seamlessly real time rolled up. I might be comparing it actual versus budget and then we saw in my earlier session I did today on reporting focused we saw all the nice little interaction of drilling down graphing, maybe exporting this to Excel, adding annotations or footnotes, explaining variances, which I'll just bullet point, but then we'll focus on budgeting side. And how about now you've asked me, let's pretend we're maybe a month later, you've asked me now to update this budget for the upcoming forecast. And this might be preceded 
with my last budget or forecast we came up off of, or I could start with a zero-based budget, which uh, are definitely options you have of starting with a blank slate or preloading the budget data, and that would just simply be an export and import data seamlessly. Usually I shy away from saying imports and exports because usually that kind of implies a lot of extra manual tedious work, but I can do that in really in minutes, populate entire budgets, years, data of last year's actual for all my location departments in minutes as my starting point. Okay, but I'll probably save some of these little role-based scenarios for maybe a future session that I have devoted to such. Now what I'm transitioning to is in my quick launch area, I was just showing you the shortcut to my report. And now I'm going to come here to my shortcut from my budget input screen. And to save time, I have opened up my budget input screen for three different departments because really I want to emphasize where you might have a shared common line set, what I call my default line set or you might have a unique little override tailored for whatever department you do pull up. So of the three departments, here is the suffix of department 100. They have expenses only, or here is a second screen. Here in yellow, department 300, they share the same template, expenses only. But now here my third tab in department that I have open is one of my sales and cost of goods sold departments. And they have a different line set structure where even here is maybe one example of two or more of where I'm taking my budget and or actuals you see here, columns to the right, to levels beyond what is in my general ledger. Meaning, again, motors of product 10 or product 20 compressors, these products are not in my general ledger. But by all means, I can still budget to those, including statistics like units sold, price per, these are not my general ledger, but I can add those literally in seconds inside the application. And second example would be, as I go back to department one here, on the salaries, let's look briefly to the human resources detail. Here is my employer position, another example that's not my general ledger that I can definitely budget for. All right, let me just give you maybe a little three-minute overview of the data input screen's key concepts. And then we'll look at some behind the scenes setup elements in this crash course. First of all, for color coding, any colors you wish you can utilize. And let me just take you to one little sidestep where I can globally define some of these. But then secondly, at the line by line level, I can also do a different color. So I'm currently just want to show you under file and options. We have this button here called color settings because sometimes I like to have this line here called calculated items. I like to use a universal gray shade for items that indicate what maybe you, the end user, or I stay away from that might be calculated ahead of time. They could either be calculated based on a formula or they could be calculated based on data driven from one of our detail screens like HR Capital. Okay, but there's at least a little plug for some color, that you might prefer. Now, additionally, I made a comment about the line set. Okay. Now, this end user does not have access to the line set, but my power user, I will segue to that. For the next bullet points, one would be line item detail. I'm going to come up here in the toolbar, expanding all my line item details, like those in green, or collapsing it for some budget detail I might want to provide or analyze. Next bullet point might be audit trail history, where I can see changes made to an account and when. So how about this disability insurance and the button called history. I can see a nice little time date stamp of what user, like Derek, I'm logged in as a generic manager one, on this date and time, change the budget value from X dollar to Y dollar. I'm looking at history of a single account like account 6260 for my disability, but I can also look at history across multiple different accounts. Because here in my original input screen, sometimes I like to go full circle and do a quick little repeat of what I just showed you. My cursor was anywhere on this line for disability, and I clicked on this button here called history. 
to see that. Once again, this was looking at a single account, but if I wanted to see history across multiple different accounts, I'm going to put my cursor on not a specific aligner account. I'm just putting on a blank line up above. Same story here, history. However, this time, I'm going to, going to see history for this entire department, which I also could see the history amongst the entire budget as well. But here's maybe the different accounts. I have the expansion. So let's say legal services. I can expand to see who changed the value and when. And then also I can have some little filters like, hey, maybe I want to search the user of manager one to see their change in case you have multiple cooks in the kitchen. Now, how about before I forget, this audit trail history, this is really an end user consumption window that I'm now broadcasting. And I briefly wanted to show you behind the scenes as a power user, what is called our input definition. There's just a simple little toggle button where you identify or turn on that audit trail history. So I'm now going to come to our input area. This might be budget version one or budget version two. I'll open up this budget version one generically. And then in the options tab, at least related to history, is this little check mark. So, yep, usually I like to turn on to enable audit trail history. And that's all really that's needed, the yay or nay, if you wanted to see or keep track of audit trail history of who changed amounts and when. Let me segue back to my end user perspective. I was earlier broadcasting line item detail with this expander collapse and any account that's not already formula driven or driven by a detail screen like HR capital or some of my revenue formulas, I can provide line item detail for. I can simply, like I'm just going to demonstrate for disability, I can simply right click and I was just showing you icons in the toolbar for inserting line items, but also through a right click, I can do the same type of thing along with cut, copy, paste, etc. And when I insert a line item, it automatically gives it a suffix one. Or if I insert a second line item, here is where maybe for our tuition account, I'll just review. Here might be tuition for Bob or Sally, or maybe in marketing, here's my advertising budget based on maybe method one, two, or three, television, magazine, etc. Okay, great. That way you or my boss reviewing my budget later, you can see why Derek maybe budgeted $500,000 for this amount and when. And additionally, you see some blue icon indicators. Those represent annotations. I can hover on top of it. This generically says more notes, but here you might have a better description here, like a newspaper ad, etc. And then how about on the toolbar? I'm going to click on this little check mark to show annotations column which over here to the right, these additional columns just got added, like I'll turn them off or turn them back on with the show annotations button. And then here, like we saw history, here's my memoir or note, the user, and a time date stamp of win, so I can do some nice little easy budget review, especially what I call forward looking, as we're now formulating our budget or forecast for the year or months ahead. All right, if I were to copy in an amount from one month to another, like how about here on production supplies, this account 7352, it's now $300, but I'm just going to type in $400. That cell is highlighted, and I'm simply going to do a control R to copy it to the right. Control R, maybe to copy it to the right. As for some of the detail screens, I'll now segue to HR and capital followed by maybe the revenue example I showed you earlier using maybe some statistics and formulas there. Now here the gray shade I'm using again to indicate what you stay away from. No direct data entry because the salary dollars including head counts, hours, full-time equivalency, they're locked from direct data entry because I on the human resources tab and maybe I as the budget administrator I previously loaded all these, we'll call it 200 employees we had at MSX Group. I imported them all in ahead of time. Does not matter what payroll system you're on. I simply need a column in Excel that has my department number, my name, and how much I make. Those are a couple of key fields I use to import. And then we could have some optional fields like 
pay raises, insurances like single family, high deductible, low deductible, you name it. Now let's just look from fields to the left to the right inside this screen. I'll just pick on maybe the first line or two here. One might be if I have any new hires or fires, because this person looking at the columns called start and end period, maybe I differ from period one through 12. We even can break this out by individual month of the year. So if I have any cyclical nature, like perhaps I'm in higher education or maybe retail, where I want to break these out by the 12 individual months, I could do so. And how I would do so is in my budget admin screen. I can turn on this one little check mark on the human resources tab. What I just quoted was what we call human resources annually. If I turn this off, this little check mark, then what I'd see if I were to close and reopen that HR screen, I would see the 12 individual months of the year where I can define different headcount or hours based on each individual month. Otherwise, if this is turned on, I would only have two columns of when they start and end. So there's maybe a key field in my little footnote just then. I'm going to go back to my HR input screen. I can also budget multiple people on one single line. Like here is looking at the allocation field. I'm budgeting 3.5 people at maybe some average rate because maybe I have such high turnover, it's easier for me maybe to budget multiple people on one line. Otherwise, you have the option of both. This allocation column, furthermore, is an example where, in our example, we have both hourly and salary people, where I'm showing people mixed. Otherwise, there's buttons here if I wanted to show everybody hourly based, or full-time equivalently based, or maybe mixed, meaning hourly and salary. Continuing from the left to the right, I might have original hire dates for informational purposes. Their pay rate that I'm going to be budgeting for next year, including pay raises. So here's an example on this person. They start making $25,000, but I'm going to give them a 10% raise in period three. Therefore, they make $27,500 after that increase. I even could have a second or third pay increase. Bonuses by either dollar percent. Now, speaking of, here are 10% bonuses or 15%, and if I keyed in, let's say, $8,000 or any amount above 100, like 100%, the system by default then will know I'm intending a dollar amount if I enter anything over 100, as I'm now, again, picking on this bonus field. Bonus periods, I could leave blank and maybe accrue that in all the different months that I work. Like, let's say I work the entire year, periods 1 through 12, then this 8,000 would be spread evenly, or otherwise in the bonus periods, I can come up and define specific periods like period one, four, whatever, et cetera, et cetera, that I might want to budget for those more specifically in and not accrue. And finally, a couple other key fields in this HR screen are some fields you can tailor as you need for your benefits. Like in our demonstration database in the company MSX Group, we have employees in about 15 different states. I, Derek, I reside out here in California. So when I talked about that import file of, let's say, the 200 MSX Group employees, Derek would have not only his name, how much he makes, but Derek would have his location number, like for San Diego. But then Derek also might have a California next to his name. Then the system would know how much state unemployment tax to budget for Derek, just like for health insurance. You define these column names and choices. In our health insurance example, we have two choices of singular and family. But my other examples were earlier, like high deductible, low deductible, et cetera, et cetera. And then some additional columns might be workers comp, 401k or pension, which choices might be a 1%, 2%, or 3% contributor, et cetera, or cell phone, yes or no choices type. Now, all of the heavy lifting is normally done by the finance person or HR just to simply import that ahead of time. And maybe you do not give me rights at all to see this HR tab. And when we look at security a little bit later, that might be 
Again, the HR tab completely removed and not seen by me. Or if I do see the HR tab, it might be read only. Now, as I return back to the main screen and going full circle, there's where all my budgeted salary dollars, statistics for headcount hours gets rolled up, and finally, our health insurance amounts, life and payroll tax. Now, notice payroll tax. It starts higher, but once people reach the limits, it automatically tapers off. And then behind the scenes, unlike Excel Hell or some other products that I know very intimately, you might have hundreds or thousands of formulas in Excel or other products. In Prospero, there's no formulas at all. All it is in Prospero is one simple assumptions table you define. And I'm about ready to take you to that table. And I'm going to now leave briefly this end user perspective. I'm going to go back to my budget administrator screen. And let me just briefly go from the left to the right, because here, like a report, here's where I have a master line set. Because when I sled in this morning, I had three different departments that I went to. Two departments look exactly the same of expenses only. But then on the overrides tab, Whenever I pulled up one of my sales departments, it had a different look and feel of my sales line set. Or maybe if I pulled up one of my law departments, I'm using a law line set, et cetera, as we have some maybe industry standard demonstration examples here. But that's where, again, if you laid out all your 100 departments, we'll call it on a table, including locations, you might have a few different piles or line sets that might be unique for them. And I'll show you that one other example here too. Because here, when I pulled up Department C here, here's where, yep, they had units sold and cost of goods sold that these other two did not. I'll get to that line and calculation set in just a moment, but let me now continue to the right. That was the overrides I was just chatting about. Unique different templates. Now, one other note or two to make is these overrides could be for an individual department like my department 200 example. And then here to the left in the location, it means, hey, this is a summary level. These are for every location, meaning my roll-up tree based on location. For any location I pull up for department 200, use this line set called sales. But I could get more granular. I could say, nope, instead of everybody, meaning all locations, I might say just the East people, or it'd probably be more applicable in the department that I might have a little roll-up tree where I might have a subgroups of my department tree of we'll call it manufacturing departments versus administration departments. This tree does not represent that, but I want to at least quote that my tree could reference a summary level item as well and or an individual posting item. All right, and then I'm now going to segue up to HR where I last left you. And really, I just have a top half of the screen which really defines the expense accounts we're hitting for salaries. Many organizations budgeting within Prospero might only have one line here going to one expense account, but our example has a couple because maybe we want to demonstrate abilities for both hourly and salary, or maybe some global assumptions for pay raises and bonus. And when I mentioned global assumption, that just means down to the individual when I'm importing or editing I can definitely override these values at the individual or position level. All right, so the top half is really what expense account we hit, and then we call those pay grades. And then really the bottom window is what we call our benefits and taxes. Because earlier I said in Excel Hell, you might have hundreds or thousands of formulas to do some of the federal and state tax, but you have one simple table. I'm just hitting the down arrow to show you, hey, there's no trickery. I can come up here and choose an account. Now here in the account, there's my good old graphical view of my accounts, or otherwise here's a list view of my accounts. And I'll probably just continue with items that are already populated here. Like benefits in general could either be a percent of salary, like you see this rate column populated, with a limit, like FICA, or without a limit, like our Medicare example. Or secondly, instead of being a percent of salary, you might have some benefits that are a fixed dollar per amount, or shall I say, per month. Like here's our health insurance examples, where here in the field, like health, 
we have single or family, but I can come up here and insert, and maybe I have high deductible or low deductible as maybe some of my choices here. And then I would just turn on the little check mark and associate maybe the fixed dollar per month or rate. And maybe final example related to that, there might be an example for life insurance that I'll just ad hoc with, which might be a fixed rate of $10 per 10,000 a person salary. So if a person makes $100,000, it would maybe be 10 bucks per 10,000 of their salary using an increment field. These columns here to the right, I can easily add. Two examples I'll use from earlier might be pension and cell phone. So on the little toggle bar, we already have five columns showing. Mike, these two I'm currently not utilizing, but I'm going to click on this up arrow, add a sixth column, and I'll just call this cell phone. And then I'll just insert again, and I might have just one choice. It might be yes, or maybe I have a choice of yes, $100 per month, or I might have another choice of yes, $200 per month based on what type of breakdown that you want. And then maybe some of my salespeople might be this value or that value. Like Derek, going back to my California state example, when Derek, for his state unemployment, since Derek looks in, lives in California, Derek would have a California next to his name along with family, and then the system would know how much to budget down to the individual based on this simple table. Hallelujah. All right, as I wrap up this little area here. That's some key highlights from the HR setup. Now to import HR, I probably won't go through all the little bells and whistles here. However, we have a very simple file format that I'll need for loading employees in the system. Here's maybe a visual I reference earlier, like I'll just need columns for what company or location department their name, how much they make, and then, yep, here might be Derek with Californian family type. And then here might be 200 people I'm going to preload, maybe once a year, once a quarter. Usually that's done by you, the person in finance or HR. And then let me also segue to some of the security notes I mentioned, and I'll check that off my list as well. Uh, keywords for security, maybe be threefold. The first would be, a security role or group, what they have access rights to. Secondly, their assignments, like what company and locations they have. And third, what we call visibility. So I'm now logged in as the administrator. On the security button, we only have one area up here above called user definition. And then looking here to the left, we have roles or groups. Like here is the administrator I'm currently logged in as. Or maybe there's a group that is a budgeter that has HR visibility. Or maybe this group might be a budgeter with no HR visibility. Now these roles or groups would have people within. I could right mouse click and add a new user very easily or a new role. And if I come up here and add a new user, usually we're using what's called Windows authentication, which IT loves hearing that way we can just already use your Windows or network security, which means we do not have to create or maintain separate user IDs and passwords. Otherwise, we also can create standard fictitious users, maybe people that are not in your network. Now, usually most will leverage Windows authentication, and here's what I'll call Bob, or here is maybe Sally. The next keyword would be assignments. So here on the toolbar, the assignments button, now here are the different general ledger companies or segments that we have, like company first of all. You see this asterisk, that means this user has access to all companies. I can either use the asterisk for a wildcard or here is this summary unit called all, which is that tree that automatically gets created and maintained. Or moving from the left to the right, another segment was location. And then here is similar story. I could give this person access to a single location or through a group, like it could be Seattle only, or better yet, how about Derek's in charge of all of the West? And even 
Better yet, my tree, maybe we're using ranges or wildcards if I have a cleaner chart of account. Because here's another example for Midwest in our tree, which might be all the locations that begin with a four. Maybe I never have to update my tree at all, nor maybe the security for Derek, maybe who's now in charge of Midwest. And finally, same story here, department. And then even I'll just choose one random department and I can click on the insert button and I can get more granular as need be, but usually you only have one or a couple of lines that usually serves your purpose for what they can see data-wise, like company location or departments, using maybe summary levels. Okay, and just going full circle, that is what we call assignments. And this time, I'll just do a right click, choose assignments, which you see the toolbar icon to the left that I clicked on the toolbar above. And how about last key little word on security since it's so accountant friendly by accountants for accountants is what we call visibility. My example earlier was I have maybe two budgets I'm currently working on, a best case and a worst case. How about all of you are only working on the best case? So I only want to give you visibility to that one. Now what I'm about ready to also show you is report related. And let me talk about two reports, maybe a balance sheet versus an income statement. Maybe I give you visibility to the income statement, but not the balance sheet. So my two examples, I'm going to continue with the budget input version. How about this is my best case budget that all of you have access to. I am currently have that open and in it. And then here is a button here at the very top, visibility. Usually I simply turn on this one little check mark to allow all of you, my users, to use or see this input definition. Or if not, if it's not everybody, I can come up here and click on the insert button and I can get more granular. So this field here, what's called user, it could be an individual user like Bob or Sally here, or better yet, it could be at the role level because maybe this is those budgeters with HR visibility or maybe without. Okay, so there is visibility who has access to see this budget version. Now, a couple other related thoughts to that. I'm thinking about two or three I'm going to segue to. One would be, as I'm going back to security, I'm in this button here called user definition. Let's look back to the roles here, because here is one role of those budgeters that have HR visibility. And then let's look at a key little couple of check marks here to the right. Now notice here for the setup roles, this might be those people that only do budget input that are not in accounting, therefore they're not maintaining reports, rows, columns, or trees here. So that's why all the setup items and administrative item items are blank. However, let me scroll down a little bit to this section here called input roles. Well, yay or nay, can they input data? Yes. Can they input HR? Yeah, this group, yes, but there may be another group maybe that does not have HR visibility. That tab would be completely removed and not available to them if this were turned off. Or if I do give them HR visibility, maybe I'm the control freak in accounting or HR that I want them to read only that window because any new hires or fires come through me, the HR person, centrally. So if I turn on this read-only HR, yep, they only can view it, not edit it. And that same goes with the capital screen. All right, I'll probably segue to capital in just a second. Now, another thing regarding locking data or not, I want to talk about a few other key things column-related and also budget version related, what we call book codes. All right, so for this input screen, yes, we spoke of the line set and the different overrides as it went between department A, B, C, but let's turn our attention to the column. Now, me as a budget administrator, I don't think or do, nor especially my end users, so how about this is my upcoming year that I might be budgeting for. Now, what's nice is I can reuse my column year after year after year. 
because in some older applications, especially Microsoft related, you always had to create new periods and columns and reports year after year for those that were using Microsoft Forecaster. But thankfully, we learned those lessons. We can reuse these over and over, especially the columns now I'm emphasizing. I'm now going to click on this button to open up the column definition. Maybe the first bullet point I'm going to start off with very easily is when we're talking about some of our HR and capital details, we would want to turn on this little check mark to indicate this column, like budget column, is a detailed period, meaning it's not actuals. Or another way to phrase that is, hey, if a person makes $48,000, works all 12 months, I want their salary to be spread back to all these 12 months here. Because notice here to the right, some of my budget year to date column, like here in column W, I do not have that HR period or detailed turn on, nor my actual. So therefore, when a person makes 48,000, they work from period one to 12, the system knows that these are the detailed periods or columns I'm referring to specifically, since I can have some commingled actual budget in prior year and prior month data. So there might be one key field related to HR and capital details to be sure to turn on for your 12 budgeted months. Secondly, inside the column is this field, what we call book code. Definitely actuals is very commonplace, but here are some budgets. And many times in your general ledger, you had to create a new budget name year after year after year. Like you had to call it 2015 budget, 2016 budget, 2017 budget. So many of you will see a lot of these different budget names over the years being read from your general ledger. However, for those using the Prospero budgeting, usually use the same book code like budget year after year after year. And let me now show you where these budget book codes are created and maintained. So I'm going to do one little sidestep. Here to the left under configuration, we have what are called book codes. I'm going to just click on the down arrow because a lot of times I will call it like Z budget version one, or I'll call it Z budget version two. That way, anything new I create in Prospero versus what I might have old in a general ledger, I can easily find. And then lastly, a couple key fields here to the right are, hey, are you going to allow people to input to this budget version? Yay or nay? And then if so, for what year or years plural? Now, if I do allow input, and if I left the, the years blank, that means theoretically I could input the budget for any year like 2021, 2022, 2023. But usually my end users don't have control of that because back in my input definition, they never see this little toggle switch. I'm never changing that during a certain budget year or time frame. But maybe next year when I'm in 2022, I would just simply copy this in seconds, but I'll just emphasize here, I just change that to 2022. Everything else stays the same. And then in my book code, how about now, we're one year later, where maybe then I'm allowing entry just to 2022, meaning not 2021 or earlier. So you can get granular and restrict what years are editable for you or your end users within this one window centrally and globally. All right, so again, configuration, book codes, as I added some or edited the input nature or which years are open or editable. And I can obviously choose more than one year. Sometimes I do multi-year plans, which that's probably two or three good trends I've seen in 25 years and hundreds of customers. One would be instead of one annual budget and then I'm one and done. Yeah, I'm seeing more quarterly and monthly forecasts now that you have a nice nimble tool. So you can stay on top of goal setting and trends, good or bad, like the COVID year. And I can get on my soapbox about uh, those companies I see budget more frequently usually hold their top and bottom, bottom line goals better. Or second good trend is multi-year planning. Instead of maybe looking at the next fiscal year only, I see people doing two, three, and five-year plans, including balance sheet and cash flow, another good trend that I'm seeing. And I'll try to maybe touch upon a couple of those bullet points here in the last maybe 15 minutes, but I'm sure I'll run out a little bit of a time today. All right, let me close out a couple of these windows here. 
Now, since we're talking about column design just then, let me show you a couple of other nice things I just spoke of about budgeting more than once a year. Now, similar to what we might be in our calendar year, which I'll use from January, December as our fiscal year's example. How about now, I'm gonna open this up for period seven. So me or my end users simply will open this screen up like that last window was really just my locational prompt, meaning the end user does not choose what period or year normally, does not. And notice here, once this renders, I'll have some nice columns, gray shade staying locked and away from like my first seven months gray here of actuals. These are automatically read real time from the Prospero data warehouse, which is primarily actual, but non GL data as well as I nudge my elbow and give you more food for thought of how you can think outside the box in your deployments here. And then maybe I want you, my budget inputters to budget the remaining months of this year. But then also how about years, what I'll call two and three ahead, Maybe just give me annual figures, or these could be quarterly figures, but here is maybe an example of multi-year trends to the right, including some prior budgets and actuals, because there's a nice little wizard here found in our tools. And this button, what's called Copy Plan, I can basically copy my, I'll call it base budget, to my best case or worst case budget. Okay, so really I'm just choosing, copying from one budget version to the next. And then I'd also populate the year in whatever book code, like version one to version two here. But I'll probably just leave that sort of blank here or summarize for right now. But then on the ribbon under tools, I was just showing you the copy plan. As you might be going from best case to worst case or from quarter one to quarter two. We also have some related tasks, but I'll probably save that for a future discussion since that gets a little bit more involved based on your maybe unique needs. I'll be pulling up my email at the end of this session just to have any follow-up questions for. Now, let me just show you one other quick little column design here in the background because I opened this up for July where you see seven months of data. I'm just going to close this out quickly. And then how about we're one month later? where me, the administrator, I just changed this and literally a second like I'm showing you right now. And then I'm now gonna open this up for period eight. And then automatically you're gonna see now an eighth column of actual automatically displaying. I did nothing further than just changing that one period from seven to eight. And then I'll just show you briefly the column design because I'm showing all actual periods, periods one through eight, or in other words, any actual month that's greater than period eight, I'm not showing, I'm suppressing. Or in contrast, my forecast columns, I'm suppressing all of those periods that are less than my report date, like period eight. And just what I quoted, I'm gonna take you now to the column definition. We have one easy field here and what's called suppress because here is in blue at the very top, actuals, I have periods one through 12. Or then here to the right in red, similar story, but for my forecast, I have the same type of thing. So I have really 24 columns in here, 12 actual and 12 forecast. And then here as I compare and contrast the two, like in one of my actual columns, notice this suppress field, I'm saying for those actuals, Suppress, meaning do not show the column, suppress it if the period is greater than a reporting period. Or in contrast, the forecast is, hey, suppress if less than equal to the reporting period, as we see to the right. And we earlier saw my detail columns, detailed periods. I'm only really having it turned on for those applicable months that show. All right, nice, easy column design. Let me now just plant the seed, even though I might not be able to get in all the details for it. And I have maybe 10 minutes remaining. I'll finish up the last couple of minutes checking out our question queue, but at least a plug for capital budgeting, then to balance sheet and cash flow. I'm now as the end user. Here's our budget input screen. 
and let me go to a department that I usually pick on because here at the very bottom, let's role play. I'm in the IT department or a manufacturing department and I need some more computers or equipment. On the capital tab is where I can maybe budget for that. I can come up and click on this button called insert. If I add rights to this tab and edit rights or I might be read only or not seen at all. And then really I simply just give it an ID and description. I choose from this little pick list that you define what these IDs and labels are. And really what the system's going to tell the system behind the scenes is three things. When you define these capital types, you define the depreciation expense account these hit. Secondly, the life and months for that depreciation expense. And third thing you define is what capital account. Like you see a couple of these columns in the background of the life and capital and depreciation accounts. So again, you control these IDs and names of this pick list. And then as I cancel out, here's an example where I need five computers, each at $2,000 that I might be budgeting in period one, two, or three, et cetera. So here's my total cost taking the count times price. So $10,000 I'm budgeting maybe in period one, or here's an example of maybe Prospero purchase of $7,000 in period nine. As I return back to the main screen, there is now my $7,000 capital outlay in the month of September. I'm in just a single department A. Now, finally, I'm going to wrap up with maybe me, the budget administrator. I want to now review my balance sheet and cash flow. So I'm just going to close out of a couple of the income statement screens I was in earlier. This is something usually more centralized that the finance person does, meaning balance sheet and cash flow versus the income statement being separate and down at the lower level here. And I'm now going to pull up my balance sheet and cash flow screen. I already mentioned one difference being more centrally input as opposed to by the, all the multiple location departments, but you can input the balance sheet and cash flow at as many different entities or levels as you wish. The second difference being a column for the beginning balance. That would be read from your general ledger database system like we spoke of actuals earlier. And maybe third and finally, difference, the balance sheet would be a different line set that has perhaps balance sheet accounts in it and maybe formulas and statistics related to, let's say, receivables is these many days sales outstanding. Or here's an example of net income. Now here is one of our summary accounts. A session earlier today, we looked at account roll-up trees. We had an account called net income that rolled up all my revenue expenses. So here, easily in real time, we're grabbing net income across all location, all departments, seamlessly in real time for net income then to show on my balance sheet. So there's just one automation of probably 10 or 12 I could also rattle off on the budgeting side or maybe this balance sheet and cash flow screen. All right, uh, usually time does fly in this one hour crash course. So let's on some maybe departing words. I'll check our question queue out in just a second, but one would be my email contact. I like Derek.Krebs. So if you have any specific questions from today's session, feel free to reach out to me or otherwise we have a nice generic email as well at info at msxgroup.com. And let me now toggle to another screen just to see if there's any questions in the queue here. All right, and then I think a question was talking about maybe some color coding. Uh, that was really just uh, me indicating maybe gray shade or locked from input. That maybe hopefully I addressed that question along the way. You probably are aware of our webinar schedule series, but as some departing other words here at our website, msxgroup.com a link in the top right for upcoming events, like here's our webinar schedule. Like every month we hold maybe about eight to 10 one hour webinars to further give you tips and tricks and knowledge. Additionally, twice a year, we have our user forums. This is two, two full days free and online of product training. We just did our fall form a little bit early since we have a couple other conferences we present at upcoming ahead, but uh, be sure to look for the email newsletters of these schedules that we like to remind you occasionally of. Otherwise, thanks for joining us today. They're live or via the recording. 
And otherwise, have a good rest of your day and week and happy reporting and budgeting. Goodbye, everybody.